Families are complicated. I'm sure to many that sounds like the understatement of the century. But your family might not look the same as mine. What a family looks like and the expectations of one family member towards the others isn't the same in every culture around the world, and it hasn't been the same for every culture throughout history. This fact was at the core of the French historian Philippe Ariès' book, L'enfant et la vie familiale sous l'ancien régime, published in 1960 and translated into English as Centuries of Childhood, a social history of family life. You see, Ariès saw childhood not only as a biological phenomenon, but as a social one as well, one which had its own history. Ultimately, he argued that childhood as a special category was modern, only really appearing starting in the 17th century. Before that, he claims, children, once weaned, were thought of as just small adults. Now, that idea by now has been thoroughly debunked. Arié is praised for having essentially started the study of the history of childhood and playing a huge role in the development of social history as a whole. He was right to have asked the questions he did, not assuming that childhood is a concept that's gone unchanged throughout history. But his specific conclusions in this case have been proven wrong by countless historians. Today, however, I want to address one particular idea which seems to have originated with Arié, but has since spread far beyond the confines of academic literature. An idea I see repeated every now and again on the internet and other popular media, probably because at its face, it does make some sense. This is the idea that because infant and child mortality were so high in the Middle Ages, parents didn't invest themselves emotionally into their children and therefore weren't saddened by their premature deaths. But as I hope this video will make clear, that really wasn't the case. In a discussion on the lack of depictions of deceased children in commemorative art, Arié wrote that it was thought that the little thing which had disappeared so soon in life was not worthy of remembrance. There were far too many children whose survival was problematical. The general feeling was, and for a long time remained, that one had several children in order to keep just a few. People could not allow themselves to become too attached to something that was regarded as a probable loss. He then goes on to list passages from a handful of texts which he reads as having a callous attitude towards child mortality. For Arié, it was only with the emergence of the idea of childhood that parents began seeing their children as irreplaceable and their loss as tragic because the shift of the family's focus towards the children was tied to an increased emotional investment into them. This brought an end to the view of children as necessary wastage, as the English translator of Arié's work, Robert Baldick, puts it. But this idea rests on shaky ground, and Arié almost acknowledges this when he points out how surprising it is that the concept of childhood emerged as early as it had, since childhood mortality wouldn't really change until the 19th century though he notes that the idea of necessary wastage coexisted with that of irreplaceable children until these conditions improved. It also feels to me like it kind of goes against the idea that children were like miniature adults when he also claims that in death they're treated as even less than adults. In any case, this idea became fairly popular in scholarship of the 60s and 70s, and, as so often happens, made its way into popular understandings of history where it continues to pop up every now and again, despite the fact that modern scholarship has since rejected it. Now, I'm not going to poke holes into every piece of evidence that Arié uses to support his arguments. Many historians have already critiqued his methodology. I will point out, though, that two of the texts he cites for a supposed lack of emotion towards the deaths of children are comical works. One is a satire, and the other one is the play Le Malade Imaginaire by Molière, a piece which regularly makes light of death. Both of these instances strike me more as dark comedy than genuine callousness. And in fact, it's not like even today no one is careless or neglectful of their children, or cares about them for purely selfish reasons. Instead, I'm going to present evidence that many people, likely the majority, actually were emotionally invested into their children, and that losing them or giving them up was no small thing. Indeed, despite how common it could be. There's probably no better place to see this emotion displayed than in funerary epitaphs. In the early 6th century, the very start of the Middle Ages, the North African poet Luxorius wrote one for the daughter of a Vandal general named Oegis. Quote, 
Alas, grief, death is always envious of those born with promising fates. Death, which lays tender bodies to rest under an unfriendly star. The royal child, Demira, lies in this tomb. Her innocent life ended in its fourth year. How easily sadness darkens a joyous light. No one plucks the white rose unless it is good. She fulfilled her short life with every kind of merit, most pleasing in appearance, chattering and of modest mien. She had a natural talent far beyond her few years. She spoke sweetly, no matter what she said, and her honeyed tongue poured forth a wealth of sound like the singing of birds in the springtime. Now the starry realm of heaven possesses her pure soul and sees her dwelling among the just. But while her father Oegis was defending Libya by force of arms, he heard that his daughter had died a sudden death. This news weighed heavy upon his heart more than all the forces of the enemy, and Victory herself wept over such a calamity. Luxorius probably used some poetic license here, but the weeping of young Demira's father is unlikely to have been something he just made up. It must have at least been a reaction that would have been conceivable by Luxorius's audience in order for him to include it. And Luxorius wasn't the only early medieval poet writing epitaphs for children. The 8th century Italian writer Paul the Deacon, although better known for his history of the Lombards, wrote several epitaphs for both adults and children. One was for a girl named Sophia, who scholars seem to agree was a niece or grandniece of his. Quote, The ground, wet from the tears of your sorrowful parents, it holds you, gleaming gem, beloved Sophia. You were, O oh beautiful maiden, the splendor of your whole family, none more beloved than whom remain on this earth. Alas, you were tender, sweet, and so clever for your age, that wise old men were astounded by your words, and your long days, which could hardly surpass those of other girls, all were suddenly gone from you. With you dying, your grandmother refused to go on living. Your death was likewise the source of that death. Groom and marriage bed were prepared for you, and from there also was our dear hope for a grandchild. Woe to me, O maiden! We gave to you a sepulcher for a marriage bed, a sorrowful funeral service for wedding torches. Alas, we mourners beat our breasts with our fists in place of applause. Lamentations resound everywhere in place of kithra and song. A savage frost has melted away gleaming life, and a harsh storm has carried off a purple rose. Sophia's age is not explicitly given, but the language Paul uses indicates that she was probably anywhere from 7 to 15, the age at which an aristocratic girl would have been betrothed and prepared for marriage, especially if we take the reference to a groom being found as literal, though she could have been older or younger still. A child of this age might have been expected to live longer, but she was still considered a child, vulnerable and delicate, and death even at this age was not uncommon. But age is a lot less ambiguous in another one of Paul's epitaphs, written for a daughter of his later patron, Charlemagne, the king of the Franks. Quote, Hildegard, a bitter funeral swiftly snatched you away, just as the northern wind devastates privets in the early spring. The cycle of your life hadn't yet completed a year, nor had the equinox reached you. Little one, you leave behind no little grief, piercing your father's royal heart with a javelin. Sharing the name of your mother, you renew her pain, after having lived barely forty days. We shed rivers of tears with a mournful heart. You, abundantly happy one, reach for great joys. Hildegard was practically a newborn. Her death could have been nothing but expected. A probable loss, perhaps, but far from being just a little thing hardly worthy of remembrance. This newborn child, named after her mother, was commemorated and is still known over 1,200 years later. But, of course, these were all nobles, children who might be more likely to survive if only due to the fact that they were less likely to suffer malnourishment. But other types of writings also attest to parents' affection and emotional bonds with their children, many of them with happier endings. Miracle stories are some of the most abundant sources in the Middle Ages, and they're extremely helpful in getting a look into the experiences of more common people. Saints were often approached in hope of miraculous healing, especially when medicine was ineffective or unavailable, and there are plenty of stories with parents bringing their children to a saint's shrine or praying to a saint in order to heal their children, and the ways in which they react are telling. <laughs>
One story by Gregory of Tours, for example, tells of parents bringing their sickly three-year-old to the tomb of St. Maximus of Rie, but sadly the boy died on the way. Gregory notes how the parents grieved, shouted, and cried, finally leaving the lifeless body on the saint's tomb. However, when the church doors were opened the following morning, the boy was alive, hobbling along holding the side of the tomb since he was too young to walk properly. As I'm sure you can imagine, his parents were thrilled. Later sources, and those from across the medieval world, all attest to very similar feelings of overwhelming grief and pain in parents afraid of losing their children, and similar joy and relief when they're saved. One story from late medieval England tells of an eight-year-old boy named Nicholas who drowned in a river, and whose parents, after finding his body, collapsed and passed out because of how overwhelmed with grief they were. Their neighbors had to pour water onto them to wake them up, meanwhile pulling Nicholas out of the river and praying to St. Thomas de Cantilupe, who miraculously brought the boy back. The historian Daniel Griego notes how this and similar stories attest not only to the parents, but the whole community caring for the well-being of each other's children, with some stories showing how the neighbors grieved as much as the parents. Of course, miracle stories and hagiographies are their own genres, with their own tropes and objectives. They don't always necessarily reflect what or how things actually happened. But, like I said with Luxorious, Clearly, these authors think that these are reasonable, realistic reactions. Reactions their audience would expect from grieving parents. People were also concerned with the afterlife of their children. The practice of infant baptism started quite early on, with parents wanting to guarantee the spiritual well-being of their children as soon as possible, precisely because so many of them died at a young age. This was especially the case once St. Augustine argued that all were born carrying original sin, which was cleansed through baptism, which also meant that unbaptized babies, no matter how innocent, were bound for hell. This added an extra layer of grief for parents who lost children before they could be baptized, including through miscarriage. Technically, these weren't allowed to be buried in hallowed ground, but archaeological evidence shows how this was sometimes done anyway. And... In any case, it's not like the choice of a separate burial place or method for ideological reasons necessarily means that the child wasn't loved and cared for in life. This should also be kept in mind for pre-Christian contexts as well. Excavations of pre- and early Christian graveyards in Scandinavia and England have both shown a less-than-expected proportion of infant remains, even when accounting for the fact that bones of young children don't preserve as well. But Sally Crawford points out that the fact that there still are some, whose burials range from simple to lavish and from individual to communal, makes it hard to determine why that is. And Eleanor Scott points out in her work on the archaeology of infancy that in many cultures, child death, being extremely stressful and often seen as unnatural, was frequently accompanied by a lot of ideological significance, which leads to burial practices which are otherwise atypical for that society. So, like with the unbaptized and Christian contexts, we can't necessarily assume that it's because of a lack of care. Turning back to baptism, though, it's probably significant that later medieval writers, like Thomas Aquinas, came to understand deceased, unbaptized infants as residing in limbo, a part of hell which had neither joy nor torment, since, although they were tainted by original sin, they weren't guilty of any conscious sins. Whether this idea was influenced by grieving parents is unclear, however. It could have simply been through logical contemplation, since this was also the place where medieval thinkers would place the pagan philosophers, who were moral and upright, but likewise unbaptized. Now, some parents did get rid of their children, but in most cases we shouldn't see this as an emotionless transaction. In the earlier centuries, it was common for children to be given to monasteries as oblates, this was famously the case for the Anglo-Saxon monk Bede, who joined the monastery of Monkwearmouth at the age of seven, and Hildegard of Bingen, who was given to the church around the age of eight. But, as pointed out by the historian Micah de Jong, the giving of children to a monastery was not something done lightly. It was conceived of as a sacrifice, analogized to the burnt offerings of the Old Testament, a sacrifice defined by the fact that it was completely consumed and nothing was left over for the giver the ultimate sacrifice, a connection which speaks to the importance for the parents of the child being given up. And this kind of gift exchange, like all gifts to the church, created a bond between the family and the church, be it 
the individual church or the larger institution, tying them together. In this way, giving a child to the church was a lot like giving a child away in marriage. We also see similar dynamics in children given as apprentices to masters of a craft who become closer to their old master than their parents. Sometimes parents even hired out their children as seasonal labor in nearby towns, though Jean-Pierre Cuvillé notes that this was often by families from more isolated mountain communities, who may have also hoped that it would bring their children more opportunities, both for work and marriage. Of course, there were children who were outright abandoned, with the most common reason being poverty. But even so, this might speak more to desperation than lack of caring. The 13th century Swabian law code, the Schwabenspiegel, only permits a parent to sell their child into servitude in extremely dire circumstances, and even then the father must find a master who's considered suitable. But even when children were just left somewhere, it was less often exposure to the elements to die, and more often abandonment somewhere like a monastery, a crossroads, or somewhere else where someone could have been expected to find them, which may have been the parent's hope. Outright infanticide was much less common, though it did happen. It's difficult to generalize about people's attitudes in a culture when cultures are so internally diverse. But it seems that the majority of parents in the Middle Ages were quite emotionally invested into their children, despite the fact that they could easily lose so many of them so young. It's good to approach questions like these, avoiding as much as possible letting our preconceived ideas about how a society is supposed to work color our conclusions. But in this case, the vast majority of the evidence points to this. There were, of course, parents who were detached from their children, but as I've already mentioned, this is still the case even today, despite the fact that we still expect parents to have these emotional connections. In any case, I hope you enjoyed this little look into medieval life as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you, despite the tragic nature of some of the sources. As always, I thank you all very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.